Are you curious about discovering ways of making your life better? Then welcome to my podcast. I'm Bob Nickman, and this is The Exploding Human. Listen in while I talk with all kinds of people in the fields of personal growth, health and healing, alternative therapies, psychology, spirituality, environment, and the future. I'm looking for those answers that make life better for everyone. You'll meet cutting edge practitioners, doctors, artists, filmmakers, business people, and those who have overcome challenges. The brave, the curious, anyone who's out there helping us humans to explore, expand, and explode. Appreciate uh, having you listen. Uh, interesting uh, episode this week because I uh, picked something that uh, just sort of came my way, and it's the healing power of poetry because I have a friend, Brian Avery, who I'm going to be interviewing, and he uh, has been uh, studying poetry his whole life. He's uh, a man in his 70s and uh, a friend of mine. So he... Uh, had this uh, uh, situation where he uh, had to undergo some uh, uh, a stent put in his heart without anesthetic. We could never figure out exactly why in the interview that was the case, but uh, he'll let me know. And he began to recite poetry as a way of getting through this surgery without anesthetic. And he talks about what that uh, what that was like and how he did that. And it's kind of a wide ranging uh, interview. It's not just about poetry, although he recites some wonderful poems. We also talked about um, a variety of topics, romance, uh, death. This was uh, interview was right before uh, my father passed away, and I knew that that was going to happen. So we talked a little bit, a little bit about that, and he read a poem to me about that, which I actually recited at my father's funeral. So I owe him a, a real debt of thanks for uh, turning me on to that beautiful poem by Raymond Carver, which you're going to hear. So uh, check it out. This is Brian Avery. Veterans Day, we're going to do this podcast on the healing power of poetry. Yeah, in honor of the veteran. Yes, and were you a veteran? I know I asked you that earlier. I was not. I was examined. Uh, I was, you know, sent up for the draft at the Vietnam War, but regrettably I had flat feet and had had a spinal fusion, so I was not accepted. Okay. To my regret. Well, we can still um, honor the people that did Amen. serve. And deserve. And, and there's a lot of them. There sure are, and they deserve it. And maybe one day poetry will uh, eliminate uh, the need for war. It could do that. Yeah. The, it, gr- the, gr- the Greeks thought so. Did they? I think they did, yeah. Oh. The great Greek poets. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's, you know, I guess we've been trying to do that for a long time, some of us. But in thinking about it, they actually also celebrated war, you know, with the Odyssey and, and things like that. I read that. <laughs> required <laughs> reading, but I but I did enjoy it. Yeah, <laughs> me too. So I was talking to Brian. Brian is my neighbor and a, and a very old friend of mine. And he told me a story, um, and we're going to get to it a little bit later about how poetry, how he used poetry to get through a surgery. Is mm-hmm. that correct? That is correct. Yeah, and we're going to get to that in a second. But let's talk about for a minute. I know that you're involved in a in a poetry. Um, group of some type and how did you come to poetry and tell us about that first well i think i first came seriously to poetry through a great acting teacher i had named agnes moorhead oh yeah agnes uh affectionately referred to as aggie had us her students memorize poetry as well as do scenes from plays so she was a uh, an acting teacher as well as, as an yes actress. yes she was she was the mother on bewitched she was <laughs> that's she what was i remember uh, my my sort of uh lowbrow heathen uh right. <laughs> knowledge I, base is that i had won a high school competition uh, as best actor for uh playing um caesar in caesar and cleopatra and she presented the award and i asked her if i could study with her and she said yes So I began going to her home. She taught out of her home, a basement in her home. And at the time, young, I was in high school at the time, um, I was introduced to Gore Vidal, Christopher Isherwood, uh, men whose names I did not know, but of course later on found out that they were quite prestigious. So we had class downstairs in her home, and uh, as I said, she uh, loved poetry. 
And uh, she introduced me to the great American poet, Edna St. Vincent Millay. And um, the first poem I memorized of Edna's is a sonnet. Uh, may I give it to you? Sure, I'd love to hear it. We'll start. With, it's good to start with <coughs> an actual poem since we're talking about yeah. that. Mindful of you, the sodden earth in spring, and all the flowers that in the springtime bloom, and dusty roads and thistles, and the slow rising of the round moon, and all throats that sing the summer through, and each departing wing, and all nests that the bared branches show, and all winds that in any weather blow, and all the storms that the four seasons bring. You go no more on your exultant feet up paths that only mist and morning knew, or watch the wind, or listen to the beat of a bird's wings too high in air to view. But you were something more than young and sweet and fair, and the long year remembers you. You know what I enjoyed most about that poem was watching you <laughs> recite it <laughs> because you were transported it, you know your face was different yeah. you you um you were in you were in it um and so you know I know you were an actor but this poetry thing sort of <coughs> took hold at a very young age and and yeah. um well I I go on a trip with it and I must say I asp I embrace the words of the great American poet, uh, gratefully still living and with us, Mary Oliver, who says that poetry is a life-cherishing force, for poems are not words after all, but fires for the cold, ropes let down to the lost, something as necessary as bread in the pockets of the hungry. Yes, indeed. And I believe that. Yeah. It's really beautiful. Um, th you know, this idea uh, that uh, or my experience is when I when I hear a, a good poem is I don't know I can't I don't know why it's affecting me the way it is mm -hmm. right. but there's something that that person that constructed that poem mm -hmm. is communicating in a visceral way that is not necessarily logical or um, you know different than prose it it, mm -hmm. it 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 sort of uses the language to speak at a visceral level. Indeed, absolutely. And so you feel, I guess the word would be um, moved, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. in some way. Yeah, I, I, I get inspiration, graces, beauty, and um, just tremendous um, spiritual um, healing from poetry. You know? Mary was one of the first poets that I seriously got into. I have five of her poems memorized. In fact, I just finished yesterday memorizing another poem of <laughs> hers called Sleeping in the Forest. And the, let me ask you this. I know that you, you do memorize poetry because sometimes I'll be talking to you on the street and, we'll <laughs> and, and you'll launch into a poem and it's fairly complicated lengthwise and wordwise <coughs> and yet, what is it about you uh, memorizing it as opposed to just reading it and enjoying it? I mean, you have that, and what makes <coughs> you want to memorize a certain poem? Well, I'll get to a point in a poem, I'll illustrate it, uh, where I read something that is like that knocks the spiritual air out of me, so to speak. Uh, and I'll give you an example. In this poem I just memorized called Sleeping in the Forest, it goes like this. I thought the earth remembered me she took me back so tenderly, arranging her dark skirts, her pockets full of lichens and seeds. I slept as never before, a stone on the riverbed, nothing between my thoughts and the white fire of the stars, but my thoughts, and they floated light as moths among the branches of the perfect trees. All night, I heard the small kingdoms breathing around me, the insects and the birds who do their work in the darkness. All night I rose and fell as if in water, grappling with a luminous doom. By morning I had vanished at least a dozen times into something better. So when I was reading that poem and I got to the line, which I actually misquoted the first time I just recited it, the line that said, um, 
there was nothing between me and the white, I said my thoughts, the line is, there was nothing between me and the white fire of the stars, but my thoughts, and they floated light, had light as moths among the branches of the perfect trees. And I went, wow, nothing between me and the white fire of the stars, and suddenly I'm visualizing the heavens and the white fire of the stars, and it just knocks the wind out of me. So I want to, uh, because I met the great poet Robert Bly about a dozen years ago at what used to be a fantastic bookstore up in San Vicente called Dutton's Books, Dutton's Brentwood. And we had some mutual friends, and I was there to see the great man. He was touring the country with an anthology of translations called The Winged Energy of Delight. So I met the great Robert Bly, and we went for a walk. And as we were talking, he said to me, You know, Brian, if you love a poem, you do it a disservice to always take it from the page. He said, If you love it, make it your own. So that also encouraged me, this is about 10 oh, years ago, okay. to start you know, making them my own. And since then, I've made several dozen my own. <laughs> uh, I was just thinking about the phrase luminous doom hmm. in that poem. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? Yeah, there's a, there's a feeling of uh, that poem's got a little bit of about uh, death in it. It does. And in fact, one of my favorite poems of hers, um, which I'd love to share with you and our listeners, is called When Death Comes. And uh, it's quite profound, and it says, When death comes like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering, what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I think of eternity as no more than a possibility. And I think of time as another idea. And I look upon each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular and each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending, as all music does, towards silence, and each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say, all my life I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if, I've, if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to simply just have visited this earth. Damn, that is a great poem. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, I love wow, it. I'm getting teary. Really? Well, and yeah, I actually got a little teary there. And you, you triggered it because of your mention about death, you know, so I thought, well... Well, and I'm, I'm, I didn't tell you this, but... Um, I, uh, I'm, uh, my father is in the process of dying, oh, I'm sorry. um, probably the next, you know, very, very, very soon. I'm sorry. And I'll be going there, uh, to, I, <coughs> I just saw him recently, mm. but he's, um, 90, almost 96. Wow. And, um, I, al I always wonder, you know, about, uh, the mystery of what that is, you know, it's, uh, um, yeah, Cottage of Darkness. Yeah, I mean, we've all lost people that we mm. uh, care about, and uh, there's something s incredibly mysterious about the whole thing because mm -hmm. it's, you have this vibrant life force, this mm -hmm. these people that we're very close to, that w uh, you know we're connected to, exactly. that, are that are a part of us, and then that sort of uh, that person, in certainly in the form that w you and I are in right now, is gone. Right. But there is something left. There's, you know, mm -hmm. that's in us and that's in the world. And um, right. that's the mystery to me is that, that you know, um, that connection mm -hmm. to, to, you know, what there, there's an eternal sort of uh, feeling to, to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I was reading this book many years ago, some Eastern philosophy or something. I don't really remember the book. But they were talking about life being a, um, a, uh, a lake, a smooth lake and when someone dies 
a, um, a stone is thrown into the lake and the the greater the impact the person has on hmm. on the people around them, the bigger the stone and the bigger the ripple. Wow. However, even if you throw a giant boulder into that lake <laughs> and it's rippling up <laughs> onto the shore and there's <laughs> waves and waves, very soon <laughs> that lake gets smooth again. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, it was just talking about Yes, we you know we make an impact, but at the same time, there's this eternal kind of smoothness to the to the mm. water, mm-hmm. which brings me now to that story you told me, since that was sort of a brush with death, and uh, <coughs> you know, um, thankfully it didn't happen because <laughs> we're here today. C- can I before we do that? Yes, can I just you can read a poem in honor of what you just said about your father. Absolutely, that has resonance about that, and I want to say that I first. I I just haven't been able to memorize this poem. It's one of my absolute favorites, but it's it's just too overwhelming for me. I first heard it on the radio, read by Garrison Keillor on the Poet's Almanac, and it was so powerful, and I was so taken with it that I had to pull the car over to the side of the road and stop. And the poem is by a great poet, and but primarily he's known as a short story writer named Raymond Carver. I love Raymond Carver. And it comes yeah. from a, his book, Where Water Comes Together with Other Water. And the title of the poem is The Trestle. And I want to do this in honor of your father. Thank you. I've wasted my time this morning, and I'm deeply ashamed. I went to bed last night thinking about my dad, about that little river we used to fish, Butte Creek, near Lake Almanor, water lulled me to sleep. In my dream, it was all I could do not to get up and move around. But when I woke early this morning, I went to the telephone instead. Even though the river was flowing down there in the valley, in the meadows, moving through ditch clover. Fir trees stood on both sides of the meadows, And I was there, a kid sitting on a timber trestle, looking down, watching my dad drink from his cupped hands. Then he said, this water is so good. I wish I could give my mother some of this water. My dad still loved her, though she was dead and he'd been away from her for a long time. He had to wait some more years until he could go where she was. But he loved this country where he found himself, the West. For 30 years it had him around the heart, and then it let him go. He went to sleep one night in a town in Northern California and didn't wake up. What could be simpler? I wish my own life and death could be so simple, so that when I woke on a fine morning like this, after being somewhere I wanted to be all night, somewhere important, I could move most naturally and without thinking about it to my desk. Say I did that in the simple way I've described, from bed to desk, back to childhood. From there, it's not so far to the trestle, and from the trestle I could look down and see my dad when I needed to see him, my dad drinking that cold water, my sweet father, the river, its meadows and firs, and the trestle, that where I once stood. I wish I could do that without having to plead with myself for it and feel sick of myself for getting involved in lesser things. I know it's time I changed my life, this life, the one with its complications and phone calls, is unbecoming and a waste of time. I want to plunge my hands in clear water, the way he did, again and then again. Wow. Fantastic. Isn't that great? That's for your father. Thank you. <coughs> wow, I, I love the the whole idea of the <laughs> um the daily mundane things getting <laughs> right. getting in the way. <laughs> right. I mean I don't <laughs> I don't like those things necessarily, <laughs> but it's just—it seems like that's just a you know 
it's just part of it. What are you going to do? Yeah. Phone calls and paying <laughs> right. bills and, right. you know, eating. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So now so tell, tell, tell that, that story. I, yes. I just, uh, you know, I think we're there to tell that story because I was so taken with that. When you told me that, I had no idea. I mean, I knew that you mm-hmm. had had a heart attack, but I didn't know. Yeah. It was a week back in 2008, I think sometime early in the year. I think it was March. I recollect that because it was the time during the Academy Awards uh, festivities and celebrations and screenings, and I'm fortunate to be a member of the Academy in the Actors Branch. And I was having lunch. I had this was a Friday, and all this week I hadn't felt quite right. I'd felt uh, low on energy. I'd felt you know just blah. So I kept complaining to my wife about it. And she said, "Well, go to the doctor. Go to the doctor." I said, "No, no, no." And I thought well, I, I didn't bother. So this Friday. I had a lunch with a wonderful Russian director who, whose film that year was a brilliant film called Mongol, which was the story of Genghis Khan. The director's name is Sergei Bodrov Sr. And after lunch with Sergei, I called Nicole, my wife, and I said, you know, I said, I really don't feel well. And we were supposed to go to San Francisco the next day. So I said, well, please go to the doctor. So that afternoon, Friday afternoon, I went into the West Side Medical Clinic, which uh, serves the Screen Actors Guild members. It's on Sautel, just below Santa Monica Boulevard. And I walk in, and that's now like 4.45. <laughs> they close at 5, and they say, well, what can we do for you? I said, oh, I don't feel quite right. Uh, okay. So they put me into a room, and uh, then they check my blood pressure, which was way up, alarmingly. And so then the doctor was summoned. He comes in, he puts those little things on you, the EKGs, I guess, yeah, to check sure. things. And he mm-hmm. says, hmm, he says, I think you're having a heart attack, Mr. Avery. I said, Oh, well, I don't think so. I said, uh, I, 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 we're leaving for San Francisco in the morning. He said, I don't think so. So <laughs> within minutes, he had called the paramedics. These guys are coming in, these wonderful paramedic guys with their gurney. I'm lifted onto it. They're taking my shirt off. And, ch- and, and I'm this, psh- this is all happening, you know, within 10, f- 10, 15 minutes. I'm put into an ambulance. I'm rushed down Santa Monica Boulevard. It was a straight path to St. John's there at the corner of 20th Street. And I go right into emergency. And I'm whisked through and given the stuff to sign that says, you know, you give permission for us to take care of you and you may die. Okay, he's a sign here. You know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, literally, yeah. it says, Where do you, I may, sign? you may die from these procedures, you know, please sign here. So I did. And uh, then I was rushed out of emergency into an elevator and taken up to an operating theater. I can remember thinking, whoa, what's going on here? Because I'm conscious there was a doctor on call who's now my cardiologist, a terrific doctor named Stephen Levine, who's also a restaurateur. In fact, he owns the restaurant on Wilshire, Green 26, called Wilshire, you know, and he used to own La Vecchia on Main Street in, in Venice, in Santa Monica, rather. Anyway, so Steve comes in. He was on call. So does he serve high cholesterol <laughs> food so <laughs> he, he can does. drum up more business for he himself? He sure does. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great guy. He's a <laughs> sole practitioner. He used to have dogs in his office, you know, until the landlord objected. So, so Steve is, this is the first time I'm meeting him, and uh, it's in an operating theater, and uh, they needed to move so quickly that I was not anesthetized. So I'm wide awake, like w- right now, I'm talking to you. And uh, they went in through my hips. They didn't crack the chest. They went in through the hip up into the heart. Now, why couldn't they give you an anesthetic? I don't, I don't understand that. I don't know. I don't know. I in other words, they said, we need to do this procedure Without anesthesia, yeah. Are you, well, are you well, okay with that, or they don't? Well, even ask? they don't I ask you, you know. And and all of this is all happening. It it happened from. I had a lunch. I'd call my wife. I go into this. The, I just think for a simple checkup, and suddenly I'm now at the emergency and being taken into a heart uh, theater sur- for surgery. Within it's now. It's not even seven o'clock in the evening yet. Now, do they normally anesthetize for the procedure you <laughs> were going to have? I would hope so. <laughs> Oops, was no. it because you were on maybe a blood thinner <laughs> and they couldn't give you anesthetic? No, they said that I was coming. They said, "Oh, we don't like actors. We're going to get you." Well, out. that of <laughs> course. Let's get rid of. it. We need to get rid of some more of those. There's too many. <laughs> too many actors. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so we don't really know. We don't full, really know the full, full reason. Yeah, okay, reason, but, but, but there was a good reason, obviously. Yes. So they weren't like out of the stuff. <laughs> like, they, like the truck well, broke down on the way to the hospital with the anesthetic in it. They might have been, <laughs> but they didn't say. Right. You know? Okay. <laughs> That's why they had you sign the thing. Right. Okay. Right. So you you were having a, a procedure, which you're going to tell me what it was, yes. without I, anesthetic. 
Right, I'm lying down on the gurney, I guess they call it, and I'm looking up and I see the huge round light for the operating room, and over here there's a monitor, and I'm seeing the monitor, and I'm seeing boom, 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 which is my heart. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing that's my heart. Hmm. And I'm seeing like what look like needles coming around, like snakes actually, going <laughs> circling around the heart, you know, my heart. And it was pretty So awesome. you're watching the procedure yes. on yeah. a screen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. While, uh, well, they're, they're, while they're, they're in sticking. real time, you know. And the needles are going into your heart? Well, that's what it looked like, you know. And, and I think they did actually because it turned into the doctor. Steve told me later that I had 100% blockage in three of the five arteries. Uh, he dealt with two. For some reason, he said the third artery was okay on its own. How that could be, I don't know, but that's what they said. So he was putting stents into cleaning out, opening up two blocked arteries uh, to make them work again, and was putting stents in, uh, well, I was told later. So as this is happening, um, I wanted, I physically I could not lead, obviously, I'm trapped. But mentally, I wanted to protect myself and to remove myself and to do the best I could to cope with what was going, rather than just lying there going tick-tock, tick-tock, and, you know, watching, I thought, I started reciting poetry. And I recited poem, I have five of Mary Oliver's memorized, I have five of Deborah Diggs memorized, I have William Butler Yeats, I have Shakespeare, I have, you know, quite a bit memorized. So I just started reciting poem after poem, and they said that it went on for close to three hours of recitation. And, and uh, are you doing this out loud or just yes, in your I'm head? I'm doing it out loud. So yeah. these guys are <laughs> <They're> <laughs> operating on you, uh, hearing, and hearing you're reciting poetry. And I'm the, I'm the radio. Are they commenting on what you're doing? What uh, I'm just <clears> what a bizarre, uh, interesting I, scene that that must have been. They've uh, yeah. obviously they've never seen that before. I learned that later. Yes. Well, were, how, how no one would <laughs> that would never happen. I just right. I don't even believe the story. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So you're reciting poetry for three to four hours. Yes. Yeah. And they're operating. Right. Without anesthetic. Correct. And you basically are. I mean, what I'm getting from this is that you were transporting yourself yes. to a higher, yes, or a different place yes. in order to. Um, Remove yourself from the sort of harsh, stark reality of what was going on. Absolutely. And you succeeded, obviously. <laughs> well, there are ways, like, for instance, the word salad of Dylan Thomas, who one of them I threw out there there is the beginning of Fern Hill, which goes, Now as I was young and easy under the apple boughs, about the lilting house and happy as the grass was green, the night above the dingle starry time let me hail and play golden in the heydays of his means, and honored among the wagons I was prince of the apple towns, and once below a time our lordly let the trees and leaves trail with daisies and barley down the rivers of the windfall light. You know? I love that. You prince know? of the Apple Towns. Yeah, I was Prince of the Apple Towns. Yeah, it's in, <laughs> it's in, it's in this great book. Well, I have a book here, although I, and that poem is called Fern Hill by Dylan Thomas. So I love that poem, you know. Now as I was young and easy under the apple bough. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, and it, it comes to mind easily, and as you saw, and it's very protective, and it's sort of, you know, it, it's transportive and full of great now, words. And, you know. I'm, I'm still interested in what was going on in that room, pain-wise. Um, I don't recall pain. I have a high threshold of pain. I don't recall being in pain. So maybe they give me some morphine and I, you know. I mean, I had some uh, anesthesia that I'm not aware of, you know, because I don't recall. But you were certainly pain. awake. You don't need to necessarily be awake during that surgery. Like if, like if somebody well, else were to have that surgery, would they be awake like you were? I don't know. Uh, but to the end, they went in through the hip. So what to me is like is miraculous is that they're able to make an in stick an an uh, an ins open stick into your vein at your hip and track it all up into your heart and wind up in your heart and be able to to do work it's i mean imagine there yeah. he's, he's he's cleaning out my my arteries and he's inserting what they call stents i think they're a little like well i know what those are yeah yeah <laughs> heart toothpicks <laughs> well yeah it's sort of like a um it's uh, repairing <laughs> the the pipes yeah, like new right. new uh yeah. new inserts yeah 
Oh. You know, it's interesting. I think next time I see the doc, I'll ask him. And I never have discussed it with him. I, I've been seeing him for years, since 2008. I will ask him, um, did I have any kind of anesthesia, you know, at that time? or what? Uh, and why weren't you given that? I mean, initially, why, I was I was conscious. I was you know wide awake. You know, so I know can you get back to me on that? Yes, absolutely. I, I really, <laughs> I really want to know because I know my my father had stents, but I don't recall him. You know, I wasn't mm. there when it was <coughs> going on, but it, it was. Um, I can't imagine that he was awake during that. Mm. Wow. And so poetry has has been this. Like a friend, a great friend, a great friend, yeah, a great friend. Um, yeah, it, it it gives me so much. For instance, my I'm a romantic, and so I'll share with you a poem by a wonderful woman writer named Liesel Mueller, who lives, I believe, she's in an uh, old folks' home now in Chicago, someplace. I think she was a Holocaust survivor, and she wrote for me. Uh, one of the greatest poems that's an evocation of romantic love. And the poem's entitled Romantics, and it's a meditation on the love of Johannes Brahms for the wife of his friend. Robert Schumann was his friend, and Schumann wound up being put into an insane asylum, and Brahms comforted his wife, Clara Schumann. So this poem is called Romantics, and Lisa Mueller writes, The modern biographers wonder how far it went, their tender friendship. They wonder just what it means when he writes. He thinks of her constantly, his guardian angel, beloved friend. The modern biographers ask the rude, irrelevant question of our age, as if the event of two bodies meshing together establishes the degree of love, forgetting how softly Eros walked in the 19th century, how a hand held over long, or a gaze anchored in someone's eyes could unseat a heart, and nuances of address not known in our egalitarian language could make the redolent air tremble and shimmer with the heat of possibility. Each time I hear the intermezzi, sad and lavish in their tenderness, I imagine the two of them sitting in a garden among late blooming roses and dark cascades of leaves, letting the landscape speak for them, leaving us nothing to overhear. And see, when I recite that for you and our listeners, I'm taking a trip. I'm on a journey. I'm visualizing it. I'm, I'm, I'm elsewhere, sort of, in a way. I'm, I'm really removed. Yeah, like music. Exactly. Yeah, it is like music. It's your music. Yes, right. <laughs> That's how you um, express yourself creatively. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, obviously you're right. an actor, but that that's a different thing. This is something yeah. very, you know, you can do yourself uh, anywhere you are. Like, well, sometimes I can't sleep. I recommend to our listeners uh, to memorize some of the poetry you really love, poems, and if you can't sleep at night or you're whatever... Says the circumstance. Recite it for yourself. I do that all the time. I'll, I'll, I'm reciting for for my own enjoyment, mm -hmm. just to myself quietly. It seems like uh, I, I remember being introduced to poetry in school, and it kind of soured me on the whole experience because it was very stiff and proper, and uh, a mm -hmm. lot of it was very old fashioned, and maybe yeah. it was <coughs> like Greek <coughs> Greek poems. Kublai Khan by Samuel Taylor. Yeah, Coleridge. and it didn't it didn't really speak to me, and so I kind of right. shut it off for a long time, and I kind of came back to it a little bit. You know, I'm not really you know somebody that studies poetry. I appreciate it when I hear it, but mm -hmm. I kind of came back to it through um, actual you know music and music mm. lyrics, uh, which is poetry. Of yeah, absolutely. Um, not Ted Nugent. <laughs> <laughs> no, hardly. <laughs> Uh, mm. You know, cat scratch fever, not so much. Right. <laughs> There's that wonderful uh, short poem that is also just, I think, that Simon the Garfunkel wrote, which says, Time it was, and what a time it was, it was, a time of innocence, 
a time of confidences. Long ago it must be, I have a photograph. Preserve your memories, they're all that's left you. Ding, 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 ding. Sign them up. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, um, you, aren't you involved in some, um, organization that promotes poetry? What You were telling me about this. Yes, I'm a member of the Academy of American Poets, um, which I support. I also um, uh, have, in fact, um, there's a, it's called Poetry, and it's a monthly magazine that I subscribe to and also sometimes make donations. So, um, yeah, I have a, I think I have a card in my wallet here where I will show you. That, um, card. I've Take the credit card. I don't need the other thing. Oh, okay. Oh, just says poets on it. Academy of American Poets. Right. They're very good. Yeah, they do wonderful work. They, you know, th which is the idea to spread the gospel of poetry. So I would say to our listeners out there that if they're interested, you can Google Academy of American Poets, and if you sign up, they will send you a poem a day in your inbox. Really? Yes. Fresh poem, a fresh poem, flown in fresh daily. Yeah, by by often original, you know, unknown artists. You know, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's um, you know, I wish that the the schools would kind of introduce poetry in a way that, you know, the way you're doing it with me right now. Yes, I do too. With enthusiasm yeah. and understanding and passion. Right. Um, come on, schools. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it didn't really happen that way uh, when I was in school. Maybe it does now that's in certain places. <coughs> I, I don't know. That's why I think so many people have such a, um, not, not dislike for poetry, but they're not interested. They think it doesn't have much to say to them. It's, uh, uh, you know. Well, it, there's yeah. some initial um, requirements that you have to have, which are an understanding of language and an appreciation of words and a certain <coughs> understanding or uh, ability to um uh, experience the the cadence, mm -hmm. the rhythms, those kinds of things aren't aren't real. You know, yeah. you don't just uh, you know some of it we you know we have innately, but some of it certainly the knowledge of the language has to be taught first. Right. You need to know words and what they mean, and and then I, and then to move them around mm. the way a poet does, uh, so right. it impacts you. Uh, you know that that requires a certain level of I guess education or understanding, or having read quite a bit. Uh, so, you know, a person who doesn't have that mm -hmm. is going to just shut it off. This is a poem uh, that's one of my favorites. I don't have it memorized, but uh, I may one day. It's by an American poet <coughs> named Robert Haas. And the poem is entitled Meditation at Lagunitas. And Lagunitas was written in 1979, is up in Northern California. All the new thinking is about loss. In this, it resembles all the old thinking. The idea, for example, that each particular erases the luminous clarity of a general idea, that the clown-faced woodpecker probing the dead sculpted trunk of that black birch is, by his presence, some tragic falling off from a first world of undivided light. Or the other notion that, because there is in this world no one thing to which the bramble of blackberry corresponds, a word is elegy to what it signifies. We talked about it late last night, and in the voice of my friend there was a thin wire of grief, a tone almost querulous. After a while, I understood that, talking this way, everything dissolves. Justice, pine, hair, woman, you and I. There was a woman I made love to, and I remembered how, holding her small shoulders in my hands sometimes, I felt a violent wonder at her presence like a thirst for salt, for my childhood river with its island willows, silly music from the pleasure boat, 
Muddy places where we caught the little orange silver fish called pumpkin seed. It hardly had to do with her. Longing, we say, because desire is full of endless distances. I must have been the same to her, but I remember so much the way her hands dismantled bread, the thing her father said that hurt her, what she dreamed. There are moments when the body is as numinous as words, days that are the good flesh continuing, such tenderness, those afternoons and evenings, saying, Blackberry, Blackberry, Blackberry. Very nice. Thank you. Brian Avery, I really appreciate you uh, talking to me today about the healing power of poetry and, and, and also your beautiful recitations. Thank you. Mm. My honor and pleasure, Bob. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Um, that was uh, Brian Avery on the healing power of poetry. Interesting man, and uh, always enjoy talking to him, whether it's on the podcast or uh, just in the neighborhood. <laughs> He's a buddy of mine. So thanks for listening to the podcast, and um, come back again. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>